OK, good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me? So my name is Michael Schatz. I'm an associate professor at Johns Hopkins University. And I also have an appointment at Cold Spring Harbor Labs up in New York. Uh, so my sort of background is in computer science. So I uh, did my undergraduate at Carnegie Mellon in computer science. I did my PhD in computer science. But I've really been working in genomics for about 20 years now. Um, and then one of the kind of the major themes of my work has been kind of um, working with, advancing, and um, doing novel things with new sequencing technologies. So this started um, way back in the day with kind of you know, the, the rise of 454 sequencing, then Illumina, then PacBio, Oxford Nanopore, 10X Genomics, uh, and other related technologies. So today I'm going to give you kind of a little um, um, uh, uh, story about some, about some of the ways that we're using these technologies today. And kind of the theme for this is being able to see things that were previously missed. So the long read sequencing technology today produces reads that are very routinely 10,000 up to, say, 100,000 base pairs long. You do get a few precious reads over a megabase. And for a lot of questions in genomics, just having those really long spans just gives you tons of extra information that you just can't get from short read sequencing. So broadly speaking, my lab is, is split into kind of two application areas. So about half the time we work in human genetics. So we've done uh, major projects looking at some of the genetics of autism spectrum disorder, schizophrenia, other psychiatric diseases. Recently, we've become very, very focused on cancer genetics and genomics, um, looking at risk factors, looking at disease outcomes, you know, just trying to, just trying to make sense of the, of the disease. In parallel to that work has been a lot of work in agricultural genomics, uh, basically all the major crop species that we, that we eat, uh, rice, corn, wheat, tomatoes, pineapples, sugarcane, and a variety of others we've looked at. Um, and you might say, well, what's the connection here between, I don't know, cancer and corn? Well, you know, at the level of analysis tools, DNA is DNA is DNA. And there's actually a very interesting interplay where in some ways a healthy human genome is kind of like, I don't know, well-behaved. Well, it was really well understood at least. It's diploid. Uh, you know, it, it, there's, a really, there's a really high quality reference genome. We know a lot about the structure. We know a lot about the variants. So a lot of the tools that we work on maybe start in human and then can pivot into more complicated plant species where there's higher ploidy, there's more repeats, more complexity. And then that actually becomes an important stepping stone to come back into human genetics, and especially in the case of cancer, where there can be widespread aneuploidy. Um, what, I what my group really brings to the table is we have a lot of algorithmic uh, expertise. We have a lot of systems level uh, expertise where we know how to get you know, a whole data center working together to solve an important problem. And then, like I mentioned, a lot of our work has been focused on new technology development. Today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you um, about one and a half stories. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a full story about a project that we're uh, basically wrapping up right now, where we've sequenced 100 different varieties of tomato. And we've been calling this the 100 Genomes in 100 Days project, uh, and really focusing on some of the things we're learning and, and the structural variations there. And at the end there, so I'm, you know, I'm guessing m many of you are very interested in human genetics. So at the end there, I'm going to pivot it back into human genetics and talk about, well, now that we have all these tools, all these technologies available to us, kind of uh, piloted in this tomato project, well, how can we use them to study human genetics with a focus on uh, recurrent breast cancers? So to get started, I'm, I'm sure everyone in the room knows what a tomato is. I don't need to introduce the species. But what you may not appreciate is what an important crop that it is. So the annual worldwide production is something like 175 million tons. It's $85 billion a year business to be in tomatoes. And that's because it's just such a major ingredient in, in all the foods that we have, you know, all the sauces, salsa, ketchup, soup, salads, and so forth. So there's a very interesting kind of history to it. So wild uh, varieties of tomato uh, originate in South America. Then they got sort of transported up into Central America. Very early Western explorers found, discovered them in, in Central America, brought them back to Europe in the 1500s-ish. There are some reports that Christopher Columbus himself brought them back. I don't know if I totally believe those. But that's sort of the right uh, era, you know, 1500s, 1600s, where, when these um, tomatoes were first brought to Europe. It was in Europe where you saw the rise of these so-called heirloom varieties, where it was just like you know, your backyard farm, the neighborhood farm, would sort of um, grow a particular variety. It would have some interesting shapes, colors, flavors to it, and then it would kind of become you know, your sort of regional um, variety. And then there was all these markets that were set up where you get these interesting crosses. Today, you could find these seed catalogs that are you know, inches thick of like thousands and thousands of named varieties of tomatoes. And they all, like I said, they all have these sort of different flavors and textures and sizes and just interesting shapes and colors. So it's, it's great in terms of the genetics because there's so much phenotypic diversity. You know, what our goal really is to really understand, well, where does all this diversity come from? It's useful to have a, a wide spectrum. And then furthermore, uh, tomato is part of this larger family of, of crops called Solanaceae. This includes other familiar crops like potatoes and peppers and eggplants and tobacco. 
Um, just that uh, tomato happens to have the most resources available for it so that we can take that, whatever sort of genetic information we learn, we can transfer it to these other species, learn a lot more, um, hopefully, in these other crops as well. So it's such an important crop species that, you know, there's been a lot of work into the genetics behind it. The tomato reference genome was first published um, about seven years ago in 2012. And that was an international consortium from many countries, uh, you know, spent millions and millions of dollars at the time to be able to sequence the first uh, reference genome. It, you know, at the time it was a good assembly, you know, they, they poured a lot of resources into it, they brought a lot of uh, biotechnologies to the table. And then the current reference genome is organized into 12 chromosomes, the total genome size is about just under a gigabase, it's a diploid species. Um, it's a, it's a, like I said, it's a good assembly for what it was, but it's split into 22,000 contigs. There's, there's lots of uh, gene models that are clearly disrupted. There's lots of places where there's just n, 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 where there's unresolved sequences. There's a lot of, a lot of the genome is, is, is sort of been localized to so-called chromosome zero. This is sort of one of the, the secret tricks of genomics. If you have contigs, you're not sure where they really belong, well, you just make an artificial chromosome zero. We just kind of put them in there, which also confuses a lot of the analysis going on. So nevertheless, you know, it's a good, it's a good sort of plant assembly. It's been a resource for thousands and thousands of studies, been cited some, you know, five, several thousand times. Uh, and, but most of the time, this has been used for doing research on single nucleotide polymorphisms, right? So you can, you can resequence varieties with, say, Illumiter Vs. You can look at SNPs. You can try to associate it with some of this phenotypic diversity. There's been a lot of um, sort of pathway analysis using RNA-seq in different tissues, de different developmental time points. So it's been, it's been a really important resource for studying some of these agricultural traits. Um, but one thing that has really become apparent in, in tomato genetics, and I would say more broadly across uh, genomics as a whole field, is that it, while resources like this have been very good for single nucleotide variations, it is largely ignored or missed or misrepresented um, so-called structural variations. So structural variations are any mutations, by definition, any mutations that are 50 base pairs or larger. This includes things like insertions, deletions, inversions, translocations, uh, tandem duplications, you know, any sort of you know, larger, larger scale structural uh, change to the sequence. There's nothing particularly magic about 50 base pairs. 51 bases is interesting, 49 bases is interesting. That's just, you know, we needed a, a, um, a sort of a definition. And one thing that's emerged uh, recently in tomato genetics, I would say also human genetics, uh, other species, is that, that these structural variations can be really a driver of quantitative variation. So in tomato here is just six examples where it was a structural variation, insertion, deletion, inversion, and so forth, that, is, that, is, that was really proved to be the causal um, mutation associated with these different traits of like fruit size or how the branching forms and, and traits like this. So we're very interested to study these things uh, more comprehensively, more broadly. Uh, but if we're going to use short read sequencing, this is going to be a very challenging pro uh, project. Um, you're probably going to be missing like at least half the variants, and many of the variants that you do call will be false positives. So you have um, uh, accuracy issues both with false positives and false negatives. Now to address this, about a when did we, when did this go. About a year ago, we got started on this new project uh, funded by the NSF, where we're going to look at structural variations in tomato and up to 100 different varieties, and then look at you know, natural variation, domestication, and crop improvement. So we're led by Zach Lippman, who's a, a professor and Howard Hughes investigator at Cold Spring Harbor, like a, just a brilliant uh, uh, plant geneticist, knows everything there is uh, about it. Uh, we're joined by Joyce Van Eck and Esther Vanderdepp that are experts at CRISPR mutagenesis and also um, doing GWAS type association studies uh, to be able to connect different variants and different traits. And then Fritz Sedlak and Sarah Goodwin who are experts in long read sequencing and long read uh, structural variation analysis. Conceptually, this is a very straightforward project. We're gonna just gonna pick a variety of diverse samples. We're gonna sequence them using kind of state-of-the-art technologies. On a per sample basis, we're going to look for structural variations. And then once we have this done sample by sample, we'll try to bring this together into a unified project to hopefully learn some new biology. So conceptually, very straightforward. I'd also conceptually, none of this really per se has anything to do with tomato. This experimental design could easily be carried out in other species. And in fact, it's starting to be carried out in, in many others, including human. Um, just that we're the, kind of the furthest along with this particular project. So that's why I'm going to present it today. OK, so step one is, is sample selection. And it turns out more than 900 varieties of tomatoes have already been sequenced with Illumina sequencing data. So that's great information about population genetics, uh, some of the ver common variants that are there, some of the rare variants that are there. And various uh, phylogenetic trees have been constructed uh, based on those relationships. Uh, most of the samples here have been sequenced to about 20 to 40x or so. 
So the kind of key takeaway for this presentation is to keep in mind that there's about 10 major clades of, of tomatoes and other kind of uh, closely related species that we're going to be looking at here. So there's about 10 you know, uh, different major um, varieties that we're going to want to go look in. Now, we've, now, given that there were limited data were there, we did try to look for structural variations. We tried three very popular um, variant callers, uh, Lumpy, Manta, and Deli. And then I guess my one recommendation for this course is if you ever need to do structural variation analysis, I especially with short read data, I would not trust the results of a single pipeline, but the right thing to do is use multiple pipelines and then um, compare those results to each other. And if you see variants that have been identified by multiple variant callers, that gives you extra confidence that these are true. That's not 100% um, effective because a lot of the false positives are caused by uh, systematic errors in the alignments. So if you have multiple tools looking at the same set of alignments, they may report the same variant, but it's still false, 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 false over and over again. So you do have to be really, really careful uh, with some of these variants. Now, given all this data, you know, what we really want to do is, you know, we want to, we want to figure out some strategy we can pick from this, um, uh, from, from this collection and try to figure out, you know, what are going to be the most diverse samples that are going to kind of give us the most bang for our buck here. Now, if you're to just sort of do this um, in a sort of a random approach, which we did through simulation, we, were, we came to realize that we're going to recover, you know, just a very um, uh, limited amount of, of genetic diversity here. We want a more principled way to do this. Uh, so it turns out that this is actually this um, you know, well-known, uh, very difficult computer science problem called set cover problem, where you have in each individual, you have a list of variants. And then what we want to do is we want to pick a subset of these samples such that we can sort of maximize the total number of variants that are detectable. So this is a set cover problem. Trying to solve this exactly is NP-hard, so it's pretty much hopeless to solve it exactly. But it turns out that a greedy approximation works really well. So we're going to pick the sample that is most diverse individually, and then kind of erase all of the variants it has, and then pick whichever sample has the most variants remaining. It wasn't just repeat that process. And what's good about this is if you, in your collection you have samples that are very diverse relative to the reference genome, but very similar to each other, if you were to just sort of greedily pick based on the number of variants, you would, you would end up picking these closely related, um, fa basically family members that are diverse, where you're not going to really capture a lot of new information. But this way, you're guaranteed to uh, collect uh, basically as much as you possibly can for a fixed sequencing budget. OK, so we did that. Uh, we were able to rank them. It turns out that we didn't explicitly make this an optimization goal. But just by doing this process, we naturally picked represent representative samples from all 10 major clades, which is kind of a nice um, sanity check that we were doing a good job picking diverse samples. So now we have our samples. The next thing is to do long read sequencing. So, so this is a picture of the um, benchtop version of Oxford nanopore sequencer called the Prometheum. So I'm guessing everyone here has at least heard of Oxford nanopore sequencing, but I'll give you kind of the one minute um, version of how it works. So there's a couple of different instruments. What you just saw was the Prometheum. This is a picture of the smaller instrument called the Minion. I often travel with the Minion just for fun, but I actually forgot it in my car at the airport. So. I apologize, I don't have it here today. So the Minion is just you know a little, um, uh, just a little box, yay big, very portable, fits in your hand. Uh, what it really is is you kind of zoom in on here. There's a sensor array, and if you zoom in on one of these little cells in the sensor array, this is where the nanopore is actually active. So what we have here is um, uh, is a membrane. So this is like um, uh, typically like a. a um, you can think of it as just, just a memory, right? So it's going to separate a top half from a bottom half. It's inside of an electric field. And then the pore, like an actual protein pore, will puncture through the membrane, create like a teeny, teeny little hole uh, that separates the top and bottom half. Uh, and then, uh, not shown here, but, is a, but closely associated to this pore, will be an exquisite current meter. And when I say exquisite, the changes to current that are taking place here are at the level of picoamps. So that's what, one trillionth of an amp? compared to what we would use for common electronics. And then as different DNA molecules pass through the little pore, that'll disrupt the current. Uh, and hopefully, it'll disrupt it in a recognizable way associated with, this, with the sequence of nucleotides that are passing through here. So to actually use it, there's a little bit of library preparation that needs to take place where you attach um, so-called motor protein at the top, at, to your molecules. The motor protein will then um, dock to, to the DNA, dock to the pore, and then sort of ratchet the DNA through hopefully one nucleotide at a time, and then there'll be some current readout uh, that is associated with them. There's a lot of really interesting problems associated with that current data for, you know, on kind of the bioinformatics side. You know, the raw data is just this um, point cloud of the signals over time. Uh, one sort of useful thing to do is so-called segmentation, where you'll look for those regions where 
um, you get these discrete jumps in signal, and that represents where as the DNA is passing through, you're going to get measurement, 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 oh, and then the next signal as the next base gets ratcheted through, you get measurement, measure, measurement, ratcheted through, measurement, measure, measurement, ratcheted through, measurement, measure, measurement. <coughs> Uh, one thing that's, that complicates this type of data is you're not getting individual nucleotides, uh, signal data from individual nucleotides, but you, you get it from kind of a whole um, short sequence, so a Kamer sequence. Uh, there's sort of different ways to model it. Um, at its basic one will be, say, a, a five or six base pair Kamer model, where for every possible sixmer, you'll have some sort of um, expected current signal associated with that. So you have um, good bioinformatics problems on how do you efficiently segment it, and then how do you associate those segments with some nucleotide sequence here. One uh, thing I didn't really appreciate until I was really deep into working with these data is often a particular so-called event, so this will be a part of the signal that is consistent. Uh, a particular event there may be compatible with several dozen to maybe 100 different cameras. So you actually get really poor resolution at, a, at the nucleotide level. The reason that this works to get uh, the reason that this works for sequencing is that we're, because it's all Kamer based, the Kamers are going to overlap. And then if you maybe you have you know a hundred possibilities here, a hundred possibilities here, hundred possibilities here, hundred possibilities here, but maybe there's a unique solution that ties all those together. That's what we hope for. In practice, that actually works quite well. Um, the uh, older style base calling uses like hidden Markov uh, model type approaches, although uh, today it's all moving into recurrent neural networks to actually be able to do that signal inference. Uh, so that's, so uh, that technology now is a few years old. Um, it was first commercialized in like 2015 um, through the MinION. So back uh, through Cold Spring Harbor Labs, we've been using this on a bunch of different samples. And a typical MinION, I'm sorry that the um, scale got blocked out here. But a typical MinI run today will get you, you know, very routinely 5, 10 gigabases. I've seen some reports up to um, 20, 30 gigabases on a, si on a single MinI run. So, these, so this, this chart here is just dated. Um, so these are all experiments that we were running uh, last year, uh, uh, first half of last year. It was around this, time, this, uh, around this time last year when things got really exciting. So we were having pretty good success with the MinI. There's a slightly uh, larger footprint called the gridiron, where you can actually plug in five into one sort of box, run them in parallel. But last summer is when at Cold Spring Harbor we took, um, uh, took advantage of the new technology, the Promethean sequencing. So instead of getting like you know, five to 10 gigabases per run, on our first run here, first successful run, we got 74 gigabases. And then we got really excited about using these technologies. Uh, since then, we've run a lot of Promethean runs. This is just the first uh, few dozen. We've run, I don't know. Um, probably something like 500 flow cells by now. So we're very routinely getting on the order of 100 gigabases. So that's um, uh, similar to when you do, say, Illumina sequencing. On a per human genome basis, you want about 100 gigabases of data. That'll get you your 30x coverage. Um, so now we can do this on a two-day run. And then there's a sliding scale of costs. So if you buy Promethean flow cells one at a time, it'll be about $2,000. But if you buy a bulk, per bulk purchase, you can get the cost down to as little as $675 per flow cell. So suddenly, we have a long read platform that's throughput is very similar to like a NovaSeq, very high end. The costs are very similar to a NovaSeq when applied at scale, um, except that the reads here are going to be you know, up to a million bases long instead of 100 nucleotides long. So I'm super excited about that. And then another exciting part of the Promethean is, um, it, whereas with the MinION and also PacBio, you end up doing one flow cell at a time. With this technology, you can actually run multiple in parallel. That big box I showed you just has many slots, up to 48 flow cells that we run in parallel. Uh, so it's very easy. It's a two-day run. So you, you, know, you do a bunch of flow cells on Monday. Uh, on Wednesday, you reload them. You do a bunch more. So now it's very easy to do dozens and dozens of flow cells a week. Um, that's how we could get to our 100 genomes in 100 days. There's actually a group in China that did 100 human genomes in one week with this technology. So I think that's just a little um, sneak peek of, the thing, of some of the things to come. As I mentioned, um, you know, the, the main reason for doing this for our purposes is we're really excited about the long read length. So this is, the, I'm sorry about this, but the Y scale here is in log space. So we really care about our, you know, getting those, this is a violin plot, so getting those, um, the sort of the, the, the a bulk of the distribution between 10,000 and 100,000 base pairs, which now we're doing uh, very, very routinely. And then the kind of the last part of the puzzle is it used to be that these data were extremely noisy. Um, again, I apologize here, but the the um, 
It used to be that the raw read accuracy was only like 50 or 60 percent accurate, which was miserable. Uh, but this, um, um, through improvements to the technology, improvements to the base color, we've seen dramatic improvements to the sequencing accuracy. And now the average accuracy is, is over 90 percent. The th one thing I would say if you're working with these data is you have to be really sort of picky about your data because it is true that the average accuracy is up about 90%, but it's a broad distribution. Some of the reads are you know, 95% uh, accurate, and some of the reads will be like 70% accurate. So my strong recommendation is like collect all the data, carefully look at the quality values, and then if you see, you know, if you see reads whose average quality value is below like, you know, I mean, it's up to you to pick your cutoff, but if they're below say 80% accurate, just get rid of them because they're going to introduce tons of noise and tons of errors in there. Um, on a good run, that may exclude 10% of your data. On a bad run, that may exclude like 50% of your data. So you just have to be really um, mindful about that. Uh, so, but now, basically, we have this, you know, through this new Promethean technology, we basically have a fire hose of long read data coming in. Does anybody know what this is? <laughs> This is a petabyte of storage <laughs> that just got delivered. So it's just boxes and boxes of hard drives. So if you're going to be using this fire hose of data, you have to have some place to write it down. Um, so it's going to require um, substantial um, storage requirements. Uh, and that's because in addition to you know, collecting in a single run maybe a terror base of sequence data, uh, for a lot of things that we're, we're interested to do, um, you actually need to keep the raw data. So the raw data is that signal data. Um, these are represented in so-called FAST5 uh, file formats, where it's just, it literally is the sort of measurements that are associated with that. Um, today we need that because the base color improves all the time. So you know, the, take the same data, process it with new software, and then magically our reads get a little bit longer, get a little bit more accurate. So that's a good thing. Uh, it's not a focus of, of us right now, but also from that raw signal data, you can get information on epigenetic uh, marks. So if there's you know, methyl groups that are attached to the nucleotides, that will perturb the signal a little bit. And I do mean a little bit, like you know, an extra pico amp here or there. Um, but there is software packages now that can go in, systematically look at that signal data, identify those methylated bases. Um, this has been well established now um, for 5-methyl-C. So if you have like CPG islands in the human genome, you want to look at their methylation state. It's kind of a nice thing, right? We're going to be sequencing the genome, and then you get a first look at the epigenome at, you know, basically for free. Just, with ex just, just by running extra um, signal processing software. So if you're interested in methylation, epigenetics, uh, I would definitely recommend you keep this technology on your radar. Um, but be prepared for you know, petabytes of storage that you're going to need here. OK, so now we've collected all this data. Um, on an, uh, we, just, we have finished uh, sequencing all 100 varieties. In fact, we went beyond 100 because once you get you know, excited by this data and you realize how inexpensive it is and how, how, much, how many things you can do with it, you're going to go far beyond um, your initial plans. So in terms of structural variation analysis, there are several different strategies. There's this really nice um, review. It's a few years old, but the concepts are still true, where they really sort of lay out all possible ways that you, know, might, you might be able to uh, look at structural variations. Uh, and this, in, this includes things. Um, uh, you know, in basically in two major uh, approaches. So one is an alignment-based approach. We're going to be taking your reads, aligning it to some reference genome. A, a really strong signal for structural variations is like if half your read aligns over here on chromosome one, and the other half of your read aligns to chromosome two. Oh, that's a really strong evidence that there was some sort of chromosomal translocation or chromosomal fusion that brought those two pieces together. Assuming there's no uh, mapping artifacts. So that's a so-called split read signal, where you get you know, basically half a read over here, half a read over there. That can be really useful. The other thing you can do is so-called de novo assembly. We're going to take your reads, compare them to each other, try to assemble um, the sample independent of the, the, the uh, try to assemble the genome for the sample independent of the reference genome. And then once you have your contigs, you're going to take those sequences, align them to your reference genome. And it's kind of the same idea as that split read analysis. But if half your contig aligns over here and half your contig aligns over here, oh. That's really good evidence that there was some sort of structural variation uh, present there. So both of these approaches are valid, and they both work uh, well. Uh, but there are some sort of practical uh, trade-offs between them. So alignment-based today is much faster. Uh, today, I would argue alignment-based is more um, comprehensive for heterozygous variants. Sometimes the assembler uh, may skip over heterozygous variants if you, haven't, if you don't have the right data to do careful phasing, for example. Um, the big challenge with alignment-based strategies, though, is let's say you have some novel insertion that's longer than your read length. You're never going to get a read that's going to you know, fully cover there. So that's where I, I really see an important opportunity for de novo assembly, 
where in principle you could assemble a whole chromosome capturing you know, megabases of a novel sequence. Now it turns out uh, most structural variations are quite small. If you look at in basically every species where we have good data, the majority by count are close to 50 bases up to a few hundred nucleotides. So alignment-based approaches are really effective for capturing those. And then we're going to use de novo assembly to capture those really big insertions. So that's, so that's what we ended up doing is uh, we're actually going to be using both approaches and then integrating them at, at the end. On the alignment-based side, it's really important that you use a long read aligner. So when we started working with these data a few years ago, these, these tools didn't really exist um, in any great form. Uh, so if you try to do things like use BWA mem to align these reads, it will, it'll, it'll work in the sense that you'll produce a BAM file, <laughs> but the alignments that you're looking at probably won't make a whole lot of sense. So here are the same set of reads, this is in human, this is the same set of uh, PacBio reads aligned um, to the human genome using BWA mem and then an aligner that my group uh, developed called NGMLR. Uh, we think what's really going on here is a homozygous deletion, but it, through the BWA mem alignments, you get these like weird alignments where there's a, there is a little bit of a reduction in coverage where maybe it looks heterozygous. But the way we think about this is like the aligner is basically smashing these reads into place, right? So they have on average about 10% error. So that's a gap every 10th base or so. And the aligner does funny things. Um, a, a aligner like BWA mem does funny things in the presence of, of gaps like that. Whereas if you have a long read aligner um, that knows about those gaps, knows about those sequencing errors, it can be a lot more um, uh, uh, optimized for this type of data. And then you get these nice clean breakpoints um, that are present there. The, the way that we actually do this is using something. So whereas BWA mem uses um, a gap penalty called an affine gap penalty, where there's a cost associated with opening a gap and then a linear cost for extending in this. For NGMLR, we have something called a convex gap penalty, where there is a, co there is a cost for opening a gap. But then it is not just a unit cost for extending the gap. There's, a, there's like a convex hull there that describes the penalty associated with that. And what that tends to do is it'll, it'll tend to clump the gaps together, which is what we want for true structural variations. But then we can leave relatively cheap gaps um, as necessary for those sequencing errors that are also going to be popping up all the time. So alignment's a really old problem in uh, genomics, but I'd say there's still a lot of uh, room for innovation. And then once we have uh, the, the alignments there, we wrote a, a sort of a companion algorithm called Sniffles that just sort of scans through them and then it just notices when there's multiple reads that show that sort of same split read or gapped read alignment uh, present there. One really useful thing is that this shed a lot of light as to why there are so many false positives with short read sequencing. So this is in human where we have short read data aligned to the reference genome with IGV uh, uh, the kind of the key thing to keep in mind here are these so-called missing pairs. This is paradigm sequencing data where we had, you know, um, you know should have been a, a, a pair of reads a few hundred nucleotides apart, but now we have, say, just the first read or just the second read aligned here. The other read was aligning to some other chromosome. So normally, you would, when you looked at this sort of set of alignments, you would say to yourself, oh, this looks like a translocation type event because the second half of the pair was aligned to some other chromosome. But now when we have the long read data, we can kind of tile across here more accurately. And what it really was is there's a small insertion of, say, 30 nucleotides or so um, that, that had some resemblance to that other chromosome. So that's why we're getting all these systematic uh, alignment artifacts. So when we look at, say, translocations from short read data, something like 85 to 90 percent of them are just because of this sort of systematic alignment error. So just you have to be super careful uh, about that. Another thing to keep in mind is, you know, how, so there's always, there's a lot of noise with long read data. And, you know, some of the noise will just create spurious uh, split, leader, split read alignments, especially over things like transposable elements, where it's just sort of hard to um, get really confident alignments in there. So you're not, you're probably, you know, just like with Lumina data, where you're probably not going to believe a SNP just because you saw it in a single read, we're going to want to have multiple reads all kind of stacked up there where we can uh, reliably identify them. So what we've been doing, this, these are in two human samples where we're downsampling our uh, PacBio and our Oxford Nanopore data, just asking the question of like, you know, as you have less and less data available, uh, uh, how does that impact the variant calling uh, that you can do there? And, and then what, we've, what we've kind of come to realize is we want to have around, you know, at least 30x coverage uh, so that you get good sensitivity, good specificity with, with either platform. Um, that's sort of where uh, we were concluding there. Although you do get um, increasingly better sensitivity as you get extra deep coverage. So that's the alignment side. On the assembly side, there are a few assemblers available, and I think you're going to hear about some more later today. Um, 
The one that we rely on for kind of our um, production work is a widely used assembler called Canoe. This is based on the Solera assembler that was originally developed to support the Human Genome Project like 20 years ago, but it has been turbocharged and basically rewritten from scratch um, to support long read data. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good assembler. You basically provide, if you have the right data, um, you set it up, you push go, but then pre be prepared to wait a while. We're talking weeks, perhaps months. Uh, for some big eukaryotic genomes um, to get it to get a good assembly. Based on that, our contigs are something like 10 times longer than the reference genome, uh, just because we have much better data. The big challenge for this has just been the speed. We know we need to do 100 of these assemblies. If each one takes like two weeks on a cluster, we're talking about 200 weeks just to do the analysis, which was kind of unacceptable. Uh, the good news is there are some now faster assemblers that are available. Um, uh, there's one that was published about a year ago, or I guess two years ago from Heng Lee, Mini ASM, although that's recently been deprecated from this new assembly, newer assembler. There's a preprint describing it called WTDBG2, which is a terrible name, which they're rebranding as the uh, Red Bean Assembler. There's also an assembler that was published uh, just a few months ago in Nature Biotact from Pavel Puzzler's group called Fly, which is also uh, a really fast assembler. Uh, and by really fast, what I mean is instead of like several weeks for the analysis, it's just to be um, you know, a, a day or maybe a couple days. The big challenge there is for these new assemblers, they, I think what happened was they're all optimized and tested around human. As we move into other species, the, some of the, um, sometimes the analysis just breaks down. We've done assemblies where we expect a two gigabase pair genome, but only one gigabase is reported. You know, there's like some sort of systematic failure uh, at play there. So now we have these uh, de novo assembled contigs. The next thing we want to do is sort of organize them, arrange them into pseudomolecules, represent ent ent entire chromosomes. Uh, in principle, you could do this you know, independent of the reference um, using, say, high c data or optical mapping data or for a genetic map if you had it or uh, th that sort of thing. But the, all the varieties of tomato that we're sequencing are quite closely related to each other. So we developed a new algorithm that we, has a cutesy name called RAGU. Uh, this is the rapid uh, genome ordering and, uh, uh, ordering and orienting uh, algorithm. And it's a reference-based uh, scaffolding approach, right? So out of the assembler, you just get this big collection of contigs. You don't really know where they come from. But conceptually, it's pretty straightforward. You're just going to line them to the reference genome, figure out you know, which contigs align to chromosome 1, chromosome 2, chromosome 3. In fact, we can order them with respect and orient them uh, with, with respect to the reference genome. And for the samples that we're looking at that are because they're closely related, we find this works really well. <laughs> Uh, for some of the samples, we do have high c data. So using RAGU, we look at our high c contact map. It makes perfect sense where you get you know, a strong um, set of contacts along the main diagonal, and it kind of fades away as you move further. We also ran SALSA2, and we get uh, much more sh shorter scaffolds. They're much more fragmented. You get this sort of checkerboard alignments where um, clearly there's been some misassemblies that are present there. So uh, we get very fast uh, um, chromosomes out of RAGU based on the reference that are more accurate, more complete. So that's what we've been using there. So based on those data, we've been, um, been able to then sort of systematically scan through these assemblies and look for insertions that are present there. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure, please, please. So with, with the RAGU, if it's reference-based, if you got the scaffolding wrong in your reference, uh, will RAGU just sort of believe the ordering of things? Yeah, it's a great question. So the, there are, um, you have to be picky about under what scenarios you might use this. So the tomato reference genome structurally is in pretty good shape, right? They had genetic maps and backends and all this data to kind of get the, the overall structure of the chromosomes correct. Uh, but you're right, if you're working in a species that has a highly fragmented reference genome, that would um, uh, uh, be a, a cause of concern. Now, one th I didn't talk about it, but what RAGU does is it takes the contigs and it matches up to the reference. And then if it, it basically produces a bunch of scores associated with those alignments. So if, it, you know, if the contigs are like fragmented, that'll score poorly. Um, there's also some new modules that we're working on now that'll go back to the raw data, look at the like, read alignments that, over those breakpoints. So we're going to leverage the reference to kind of do an initial um, placement of the contigs. And then we can go back and then whenever there's a conflict between the reference and the contig, we can ask, you know, what's the evidence to support the placement that is there? But it's, it's, a, it's a really important consideration. Okay, so now we have our uh, chromosomes assembled. We can systematically scan through them, identify uh, where these variants are, um, um, and see that there are thousands of structural variations uh, pieced together. I've been going through this stuff really quickly, but if you want to go back and, and look at more details, uh, we wrote a review paper about a year ago 
where we try to very sort of carefully, comprehensively go through all the tools needed and, uh, and also tools available uh, to work with these types of data. OK, so now we've done this for 100 samples. Uh, you know, what sort of biology uh, can we learn from this? So oh, just as an aside, this is a picture of one of the farms at Cold Spring Harbor where there's just like thousands and thousands of plants that have been CRISPR uh, edited. This is definitely the future of food production in, in the world um, because you can make plants to just generate um, substantially bigger fruits and substantially better um, uh, uh, resistance to disease. So in a, you know, in a snapshot, this is a, a piece of the landscape. So what I'm plotting here is for not, this is just to say the first 70 accessions. What I'm plotting here is just the raw count of how many variants we're finding in all these different samples. So some of the samples are very closely associated to the reference genome. That's why they have the fewest. Some of the samples are quite divergent from the, from the reference genome. In fact, they're different species. They're closely related, but different species. And we're, in those samples, we're finding um, about 70,000 variants there. So there's a big range of all the diversity, which is by design, right? We're picking diverse samples. Um, most of the variants are, well, it's kind of very closely associated with deletions and insertions, followed by, you know, smaller numbers of translocations, duplications, inversions. Should we really expect there to be a big change between insertions and deletions? Not really. And that's because the reference genome that we're mapping to was just basically an arbitrary variety. So it's just as likely that, you know, it will lose something um, which will look like an insertion in a novel sample versus it, um, my sample deleting something, um, which will you know, be represented as a deletion. So you should expect to have basically the same number of insertions and deletions, although we do find a slight enrichment for in insertions in, in other projects because the reference genome may have some systematic artifacts. So, so we found this big catalog. Um, I won't go spend too much time on it, but we're starting to learn some really interesting um, uh, biology and some really interesting mechanism. I'll just give you one of the stories that we have so far. So uh, in, in, for um, uh, harvesting purposes, it's really useful to get, you know, we want to collect the fruits. We want to be able to collect these fruits as easily as possible. So there's a, um, a phenotype where it's very easy for the stem to break off. In fact, this phenotype was discovered in the 1960s by Heinz, the, you know, the ketchup company. This is like one of their big uh, innovations was recognizing there was a genetic basis for making that stem easy to break off. This is the so-called jointless gene. Uh, so that's, that's what I'm showing at the top there are varieties of tomato where you can very easily recognize this jointless trait. You can be able to um, uh, collect them pretty easily. Another important trait is the length of the stem, or actually it's the length of the sepals, um, where again, for mechanical harvesting purposes, you want them to be long. You want the stems to then just break off because it's because it makes it very easy to collect all those fruits. And the genetics behind uh, that long stem was also worked out. It turns out it's an enhancer element for the jointless 2 gene as well. So this is EJ2. Now what you'd like to do is take, make crosses where you have some plants that have these stems that are easy to break off. These other plants where the stem is long, you want to just breed them, have progeny that have both of these traits combined. But when you do that, typically instead of getting what you want, and typically you'll get these sterile plants. They just don't grow very well. They just leaf really funny. Um, they don't really fruit um, productively. So there's this negative epistatic interaction between um, the gene that is responsible for the stem breaking off and for the sepals for being very long. And it's been a big mystery in tomato genetics going back to the 60s as to like why this was. Uh, and it turns out um, uh, there are a handful of varieties that have both of these traits, but it was always a big mystery. Well, how can they overcome this negative epistatic interaction? Uh, so we, and we actually sequenced with long reads one of the varieties that had both of these um, characteristics. And it turns out that there was a tandem duplication right over that EJ2 um, uh, enhancing element. And it turns out in that, because of that tandem duplication, when you have both of these alleles present, that is necessary to kind of break through and overcome this negative epistatic interaction such that you can have plants now that have both of these really important traits there. So this is just one example of the types of things that we can learn from, this, from these data where we collect you know, this big VCF file of all these different variants that are there, but now we've pinned down um, uh, this particular trait as being associated with a structural variation of this tandem duplication. Other examples of things we've been able to do now very recently is um, we've been able to pin down through a structural variation uh, one that's associated with fruit weight uh, adds about 50% more mass to the fruit. So that's a really important, uh, important 
uh, trait for agricultural purposes. Another structural variation that we've just very recently identified uh, was associated with the flavor of the fruit. There's a, you know, the, the plant is making all kinds of chemical compounds, basically like natural um, insecticides to try to repel different bugs from eating them. One of the sort of natural compounds it makes gives the, flu uh, gives the fruit kind of a smoky flavor to it. Uh, and some varieties have the smoky flavor, some varieties don't, and then we realized it was a structural variation that disrupts one of the key enzymes along those pathways uh, to make that flavor. A lot of this work has been spearheaded by um, Sebastian Sook uh, at Cultural Harbor Labs. So high throughput long read sequencing is really unlocking this universe of structural variations. We're finding tens of thousands of variants per sample. Uh, it's really, you know, at this point, um, sequencing 100 or, or 1,000 uh, samples is pretty straightforward. You know, it's going to require some, you know, time and money and things, but uh, in terms of the technology, it's really there. And there's really great investments on the um, bioinformatics side. And as, as I gave you kind of just a little taste here, you know, we want to do more than just build up VCF files. We want to actually be able to identify um, the genetic basis of certain uh, traits and diseases. And now we can really uh, pretty robustly do this. Uh, I guess the last part here is I expect to see very similar results in basically all other um, plant animal species. So I have just two minutes left, so let me kind of pull out some of the key slides here so I can tell you um, a little piece of the puzzle for some of our human work. Uh, and that is, I'll just give you, um, just give you this slide here. So I'm guessing, uh, for those of you that are working in human genetics, you've heard of this gene called BRCA1. This is like the number one most important breast cancer susceptibility disease um, uh, you know, um, that, is, that is known. If you um, have pathogenic mutations associated with this gene, you know, you're extremely high risk, sadly, uh, where the rate of breast cancer will be um, something like 80 to 90% over one's lifetime. So we've been at Cold Spring Harbor uh, and Hopkins, we've been sequencing patients that have developed breast cancer and other cancers that had no recognizable mutations. So they had nothing on their oncology panels, uh, nothing on um, whole genome aluminous sequencing, and we're going back and sequencing their genomes with long read sequencing data. So here's an example of a structural variation, an insertion in BRCA1 that is completely invisible to aluminous sequencing data. And furthermore, the project that I'm really excited about that is just getting underway is through our collaborators, um, there are these families that we've identified where there's very, very high rates of cancer. So the pedigree kind of got blocked off here. But what happened was there was an individual who walked into the clinic uh, for, with uh, prostate cancer, and it turned out like nine or 10 of his siblings had either prostate cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, other forms of cancers. They're all negative for kind of all the standard mutations. So now we're going back with long read sequencing to try to uh, sequence these families and try to identify, you know, are there structural variations um, present that perhaps could explain some of these disorders. So I'm out of time, um, so I'm gonna skip this. But I'll just say, if you're interested, so I, I, I'm gonna say it's now well established that structural variations are really important for a number of diseases, for a number of phenotypes. If you really want high quality, accurate structural variation calling, um, I would strongly uh, recommend that you consider long read sequencing. This used to be, you know, $100,000 a genome and take months and months and months or years, but now you can do it in two days for about a thousand bucks. So that uh, opens up a whole new uh, uh, world there. The platforms have really matured, you know, uh, and then thanks to great informatics, we can make sense of these data. Um, the last sort of missing piece of the puzzle is if you want to sequence long reads, well, you need really long molecules going in. Um, that, Today, that's one of the biggest barriers. So it's really critical that you have collaborators that can extract high molecular weight DNA. Um, there are some new kits that are available now that, that help with that. But um, I, I'm expecting to see you know, basically the whole world um, accelerated using these technologies in the, in the near future. There's a lot of great people in my lab and other and for, in our collaborators' labs have been working on this that I'm, I'm really appreciative uh, to. The funding's been through NSF, NHGRI, Howard Hughes, and I'm uh, funded by Michael Bloomberg. With that, I will thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Otherwise, I'll be around for the rest of the day if you just want to chat about anything. Thanks, everyone.